Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. <clears throat> I do have two more announcements that I'd like to make before the morning session begins. One is that if you check your folders, you will find discount coupons there for use in the cafe upstairs in the cafeteria next door. Apparently, some of you missed those. Uh, but you, you do have discount coupons for food in either of those places. You can't hear? You're talking, that's why. Okay, let me, better now? Better? Still not better? Very soft. Okay, we'll see when the, perhaps the electrician can make some adjustments for Jane. I'll shout into the microphone for now. Can you hear me yet? Better. Okay, two announcements this morning before we begin the session. One is that many of you apparently have missed the fact that you have discount coupons in your folders for use in the cafe and the cafeteria here in the Glass Center. So those will give you discounts on your food uh, if you choose to eat here in the building. Second, uh, there are still two or four vacancies at the paperweight making session if you're interested. The two on, at the end of Saturday, which are very late I know, but then they're also adding two sessions for Saturday starting at noon. So if you do wish to sign up for either of those, Rody Rovner, who's in charge of this program, will be here, uh, will arrive about 10.15 and will be here outside or right at the door to take your reservations uh, at around 10.30 with our coffee break. So if you are interested in making your own paperweight, uh, do sign up at that time. Are there any other announcements or questions? Yes. Dates for next year's seminar. Um, you should have that in your folder with a, uh, some of the speakers listed. Do you not have that? Uh, I don't have the dates in mind. The 14th through the, what, 17th of October 1992? Well, you see, that's what happened. I got the date on that for 92 and on the program for 91. It's the 92 seminar that you have the tentative program for. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so the 92 seminar, you should have a list of some of the speakers that have been lined up for the sessions. And the dates should be there. Okay, any other questions? You are such good editors for so early in the morning. This, this is great. Okay, well, Move ahead on the program. Our first speaker this morning is Jane Shadel Spillman, who I'm sure needs no introduction for most of you. Jane is our curator of American Glass here at the museum. And among her other projects, she was the coordinator of Dining at the White House, Two Centuries of Presidential Tableware, our 1989 special exhibition, and was also author of White House Glassware, Two Centuries of Presidential Entertaining, which was published by us and by the White House Historical Association uh, and the National Geographic Society. Jane has lectured, has studied uh, on American glass and has lectured widely on that topic. She also was the curator of our 1986 exhibition, Glass from World's Fairs, 1851 to 1904. And she has published, written and published numerous books on the subject of American glass, including uh, in the Knopf series, uh, Glass One, Tableware, Bowls and Vases, published in 1982 and Glass Two Bottles, Lamps, and Other Objects in 83. Uh, she is a graduate of the Cooperstown program and uh, is one of the leading scholars of American glass. One of her specialties is American cut glass, and she will be speaking today on uh, a very important topic locally, a very important topic nationally among cut glass collectors, T.G. Hawks and the glass industry. Jane Shadel Spillman.
Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to see so many of you were willing to come over here early in the morning. And I'm glad they had coffee for us. I was able to have some before I came up here. Now, can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk to you about T.G. Hawks and the American glass industry. And we'll start with the... Whoops. If you hold the button down, you get two slides. Okay, this is the first slide. Now, if I can have the lights down, please. Thank you. Thomas Gibbons Hawks was born in 1846 in Ireland of an Anglo-Irish family with some roots in the English glass industry. He had no previous training in glass making, however, when he came to New York City in 1863 as a youth of 17 and was employed by John Hoare, another Irishman, proprietor of a glass cutting shop in Brooklyn. Hawks started as a draftsman with Hoare, but soon learned both cutting and the business end and moved with Hoare to Corning, New York in 1868, where he was foreman of the branch shop that Hoare started there in the newly built Corning Glass Works. Whoops. Well, sorry, we'll just leave that. There was a slide of the uh, Corning Glass Works. Thus, he had worked in the cut glass industry for 17 years when he left Hoare's employ in March, 1880, and started his own glass cutting shop in Corning, which you see here. He started with only a few employees, but by the end of the decade had a widespread customer list and had vastly increased his business. The company continued to expand until Hawke's death in 1913, but due to the gradual fall in the demand for cut glass after World War I, its fortunes ebbed, and eventually the firm was closed in 1962. Because the company was in the same location in Corning for 80 years, they didn't throw much away and had accumulated a quantity of archival material through the years, including some which was acquired from other local glass firms like Hoare and H.P. Sinclair and Company as they went out of business earlier. The Corning Museum of Glass bought some of this material in 1962 and was given more in the 1970s when the building changed hands. Much more was thrown away or dispersed through sales in the 1960s. In 1967, an agent appointed by the family sold many of the leftover glass blanks, unfinished pieces, seconds, plaster casts of glass, pattern files, and correspondence, the detritus of eight decades, to a collector who placed them in storage and forgot them for 20 years. Eventually, after her death, much of this dirt-covered miscellany was a, that she had acquired from Hawks was purchased by the Corning Museum of Glass in 1990. Oh, it amounted to half a truck full. After studying this accumulation, the paper material turned out to include the nearly complete incoming business correspondence of the Hawks Rich Cut Glass firm for the first 10 years of its life, from 1880 to 1890. There are also two bound notebooks containing carbon copies of typed outgoing correspondence for some of 1888, 1889, and 1892. It is thus possible to trace two sides of some correspondence in 1888 and 1889. The incoming letters amount to some 15 to 20,000 pieces of paper, which document the way the firm and others like it did business in that decade. We have letters from Hawks customers and from his suppliers letters from other glass manufacturers, applications for employment, and personal bills for clothing and groceries, since Hawks didn't bother to keep his personal expenses separate from his business ones. The correspondence was filed alphabetically by year in rubber-banded bundles, and we assume that the years after 1890 were simply discarded for lack of interest in the 1960s, although I have some hope that they will turn up someday. As might be expected, there are fewer letters per year in the early 1880s and many more in 1887, 1888, and 1889 as the business grew. We can't expect that every single incoming message is there for those years, but certainly the majority of them are. The only exception is 1886, which is so small in comparison to 85 and 87 that more than half of it must be missing, probably discarded by mistake in the 1960s. The letters have been sorted, microfilmed, and read now, and certain trends in the cut glass industry of the 1880s have surfaced, which I would like to share with you this morning. One of the most interesting developments which can be tracked in these letters is the determination of Hawks and other employers to shut out the fledgling labor movement and to control the workmen on their own terms, that is, the terms of the manufacturers. 
To begin with, there were agreements among Hawks, his chief competitors, John Horan Corning, and Christian Dorflinger in nearby White Mills, Pennsylvania, that they would not hire each other's men. On August 23, 1882, John S. O'Connor, the Corning foreman, the Dorflinger foreman, wrote to Oliver F. Eggington, Hawks foreman, to confirm that, I have had two applications for work from Corning, which I do not intend to answer, for as you say, it would be to our mutual interest for each to have those we have taught. Mr. Hoare and I have an understanding to the same effect, and I believe it to be a benefit to both parties. For instance, <clears throat> two of his young men applied to us for work some time ago, but I would have nothing to do with him, although we wanted hands very much at the time. Then again, we had a young man to work a couple of weeks. He told me he worked for John Taney in Brooklyn, and he suited us very well. But when I found out he was one of Mr. Hoare's hands, we let him go. So you may depend on us acting honorable towards you. John Hoare himself wrote to Hawks in November 21st of that year, somewhat more bluntly, man or boy leaving and working in another place for a month or so is no excuse for me. I do not employ them. At least twice, Dorflinger sent back workmen whom he had hired without realizing that they had jumped Hawks' contracts. More distant glass-cutting firms sought the same protection, although not with formal agreements. George Hatch of the Meriden Flint Glass Company in Meriden, Connecticut, wrote Hawks on May 11, 1881. I enclose a list of 15 glass cutters, all of whom are society men, and that was the New England Society of Glass Makers, which was the early form of the union, and have given us constant trouble. We changed our system of work and contracted with the old foreman to do our cutting, and these society men refused to work for him. They were, of course, discharged by this company, but have been exceedingly malicious and done what they could to prevent our getting men. We shall consider it as a mark of courtesy if you see fit to refuse to employ them. On July 13, 1887, a representative of T.B. Clark and Company in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, wrote to Hawks, We wired you this morning that our men had struck. We trust you will protect us in this matter and not hire any of them until the strike is over with. Thomas Hawks endured a six-month strike by his cutters and apprentices from September 26, 1886 until March 24, 1887. Neither the newspaper accounts or the existing correspondence gives a complete account of the trouble but it seems to have come to a head over the issue of apprentices. The union thought Hawks was training too many glass cutters, which would drive down wages, and that he was letting the apprentices do work which should have gone to the more highly paid workmen. The real issue seems to have been whether or not Hawks would permit union activists from the Knights of Labor to organize his men. Newspaper accounts give an ugly picture of fistfights between the strikers and the 25 or so scabs that Hawks hired to replace them. But the letters show how he managed to stay in business for those six months by subcontracting some work out to Dorflinger, to John Maris and Company of Philadelphia, and to the firms of William H. Lum and John J. McHugh in New York City. At the same time, Hawks was fielding complaints from his major customers that he was taking too long to fill orders and that his work wasn't up to his usual standards. Hawks also wrote letters asking that his competitors not hire any of his strikers, and he saw to it that two hired under assumed names by Dorflinger were discharged. Dorflinger also supplied goods to Hawks at cost during this period in a deliberate attempt to help fight the union. At the conclusion of the strike, most of the manufacturers wrote Corning to find out what points Hawks had conceded to the union. Unfortunately, his replies did not survive, but he claimed victory in the struggle. There was more trouble at other firms in that summer of 1887. Louis Dorflinger, company treasurer in White Mills, wrote to Hawks in August that Bergen of Meriden writes us his men are asking more wages and doing one-third less work. All this since July. Everyone seems inclined to fight the cutters. If they don't do it now, the longer it's put off, the worse it will be. Eventually in November, Frederick Shirley of Mount Washington and Edward Drummond Libby of the New England Glass Company took the lead in arranging for the glass manufacturers to meet at the Astor Hotel in New York City to agree on a united front. Hawks was not able to attend, but John Hoare represented Corning at the meeting. Presumably, he reported to Hawks in person, as there are unfortunately no letters referring to any decisions made at that meeting. However, neither Hawks or Corning Glassworks accepted the union until the 1940s, and Dorflinger and Hoare both closed in 1920 without doing so either. The union never really got a foothold in the cut glass business because of the determination of these manufacturers. In an effort to control competition, the larger glassmaking firms also control the sale of their blanks, often refusing to sell to newcomers. After the Civil War, the number of companies making glass blanks for fine tableware was very limited. It included four companies in New England, 
two in Brooklyn, New York, which moved to Corning and to White Mills, Pennsylvania, respectively, in the 1860s, partly because of labor difficulties, and one in Philadelphia, although the Philadelphia firm, Gillander and Son, made mostly press glass and is not known to have been a major producer of fine glassware, except for lighting. Although some of these firms closed and others opened in the late 80s and 1890s, the number of companies producing blanks remained relatively constant and centered in the Northeast, while the number of glass cutting firms cutting and engraving the blanks grew exponentially and were widespread geographically. It is not clear how widely spread was the movement to restrict the sale of blanks, but there are several letters in the file dealing with this. S.J. Merchant was a small-scale glass cutting and engraving firm in Philadelphia, and after he hired some of Hawks' striking cutters, Hawks wrote to several other firms to ensure that Merchant would have difficulty getting blanks. J.E. Caldwell and Company, a Philadelphia jeweler who was one of Hawks' primary customers, replied as follows. I beg to submit the substance of a conversation the writer had with Mr. Merchant and which is to be considered strictly confidentially, confidential, as I would not care to become entangled in any controversy that might possibly arise. Their former source of supply, Dorflinger, has been cut off, and they say they are unable to secure any blanks now, although they are about to make an arrangement with some other glass manufacturer. <coughs> the cut work that they are doing is from dealers in town buying their own blanks and having Merchant cut them. The blanks can be secured from Dorflinger, Boston and Sandwich, New England, and Hibbler Company, Brooklyn, the last of which are no doubt the ones that the arrangement is to be made with and who are probably surreptitiously supplying them now. Hawks wrote Edward D. Libby at the New England Glass Company, Henry Spur at Boston and Sandwich, Frederick Shirley at Mount Washington, and Louis Dorflinger in White Mills, and received replies from all of them indicating that none of them would sell any glass blanks to Merchant. Louis Dorflinger said, we refused some four months ago to have anything to do with Merchant. We refused to sell him for cash, and we even refused to sell blanks to John Maris of Philadelphia, who wanted them for Merchant. There's no place he can get blanks now except in Corning, and we think he's getting them there through Maris and Company. Hawks replied that he was positive that Corning Glassworks sold blanks only to ourselves and J. Horn Company. Frederick Shirley, agent of the Mount Washington Glass Company in New Bedford, said, you can rest assured we shall not sell any blanks to parties named. In fact, we should be glad if cut glass manufacturers would all agree not to sell outside shops. We hear that Mr. Earl of Hoare has made association with J. McHugh of New York. Earl was Hoare's foreman. Does this mean Corning blanks? I trust Mr. Hoare and yourself can convince Mr. Houghton that it is in his interest to supply only yourselves, and I will willingly join all other factories in an agreement not to sell to outsiders if they will not. In fact, we refuse to do so now. Louis Dorflinger wrote in much the same vein about Earl, and Hawks assured him that the Houghtons, owners of Corning Glassworks, would not sell to McHugh and Earl. Trouble in White Mills followed shortly, and on January 23rd, Louis Dorflinger wrote Hawks, we have discharged nine of our cutters. They are the leading society men here and are all good cutters. A couple of them are well acquainted with Mr. John Hoare and may go up there looking for work. Will you please ask Mr. Houghton to speak to Mr. Abbott and see that none of these men are hired by Mr. Hoare. There is no other place for them to look for work but in Corning. George L. Abbott was Hoare's partner and a son-in-law of Amory Houghton. The following day, Dorflinger replied, about 60 of our cutters walked out of the shop this morning. This because we discharged the leaders of the union. We will not experience much trouble. We think we will be able to run about 40 frames regularly. We'll keep you posted. Our men gave us no notice whatsoever. They asked for the reinstatement of the discharged men. This we positively refused, and they simply walked out. <coughs> the strike at Dorflingers apparently spread to the blowers and continued for six months, and Dorflinger met it by refusing to give in to the Union and by importing new men from Europe. At times, his communication to Hawks take on a cloak and dagger aspect, aspect as when he said on February 16th, we wrote under the name of John Dawson to Dithridge and Company asking for work as a cutter. Please note the reply enclosed herewith. How would you like your shop run on these principles? The logical assumption is that Dithridge was willing to employ John Dawson, even though he was a striker. In July, Dorflinger sent to Amory Houghton through Hawks, proof that several of his men were secretly union members, although he asked Hawks to show the book to no one else, and he was anxious to hear that Houghton had fired the union members. In August, Dorflinger wrote, we started today another first-class caster place shop and a caster place shop is one where they blow shapes in molds. And in the course of 10 days, we will be prepared to make anything you may require in best goods. We have two more first-class shops coming over, one shop supposed to be the best in Europe for large work, 
and in the course of the next 30 days, you will see some work done in this scab workshop that will do your heart good. The union is working hard against us, but we are now on top and propose to stay there. We are doing first rate in the cutting shop, and before long, we trust to be running as of old. When we get well stocked up with cut goods, we propose going for the new customers in the West, and if you will lend us a hand, as you are now doing, we can, by working together, make things lively for the other fellows and have a good trade for ourselves. This last sentence provides a clue to the extremely close relationship between Hawks and Dorflinger, which developed during the Hawks strike. Before the fall of 1886, Hawks' chief supplier of blanks was Corning Glassworks, although both Hoare and Hawks bought from Dorflinger during a strike at Corning Glassworks earlier in the 80s. Hawks began to buy more from Dorflinger after that, and he also bought English blanks and a few from Baccarat. During the strike, though, he began to buy in great quantity from Dorflinger, and during Dorflinger's strike the following year, Hawks began to supply the White Mills factory with cut wares. In December 1887, Dorflinger wrote, if you have any cut goods in hand now that you cannot use for your regular trade, we may be able to run some of it off for you. If you will send us samples and prices, we will try to dispose of it for you. On February 23, 1888, during the strike, Dorflinger wrote, this is during Dorflinger's strike, please accept thanks for goods sent. We don't expect you to cut our goods at cost. Please charge us a fair profit on our orders and we will be perfectly satisfied. On April 27, Dorflinger wrote to order more glass and said, would you like more work from us? We can send you more work if you want it and have a chance to do it. We are running now, but are short on good cutters. And Hawks replied that he was not busy and would be glad to cut anything Dorflinger sent. Throughout the remainder of 1888 and all of 1889, letters went between White Mills and Corning daily. The ones from uh, White Mills are almost all in Louis Dorflinger's handwriting and signed by him. Hawks was apparently buying large quantities of blanks from Dorflinger, and Dorflinger was ordering large quantities of cut glass from Hawks. October 6, 1888, Louis Dorflinger wrote, our alterations and repairs being now complete at our New York store, we would be glad to have you send us on consignment and with lower prices the fancy pieces you spoke to writer about in Corning. The correspondence in the 1892 letter book indicates that the situation was very little changed and the arrangement may have gone on well into the 1890s, although it must have come to an end before Thomas Hawk started the Stubin Glassworks and began to make his own blanks. We don't have proof of that, of course, because we don't have any correspondence after 1892. <coughs> Hawks was supplying glass directly to Dorflinger's New York City sales shop on consignment, as well as directly to White Mills on order. The only matter left unclear is whether the glass sold from the New York City shop was sold as Hawks, or as Dorflinger glass. There are several existing lists of the glass sold from the New York City store on consignment, but they do not specify this. Several times a year, uh, the New York City shop would send back a list of what they still had and what they'd sold and what the prices were. The objects ordered from and sent to White Mills were probably being sold as Dorflinger's glass, <coughs> presumably with the Dorflinger paper label, which was adopted in the late 80s. On August 10, 1888, Dorflinger wrote, We send today some 8-inch and 9-inch round nappies. Please cut a dozen 9-inch in cobweb, half a dozen 9-inch in Russian, 6 9-inch in hobnail, 10 8-inch in cobweb, 4 8-inch in Russian, 4 8-inch in hobnail. We'll send you some st for strawberry diamond and fan cutting next week. This is obviously an order for stock rather than a special order, since these are standard patterns and shapes being ordered in quantity. Between 1887 and 1892, Hawks provided hundreds of articles in the following patterns to white mills. Now you'll get to see some glass instead of just people. There you are. Cobweb, which is the pattern in the center here, which was a Hawks pattern. Russian, hobnail, strawberry diamond and fan, which are all three here. Parisian, now that's a Dorflinger picture, but Hawks cut quantities of Parisian for Dorflinger. Pillars, which you see in the upper right on this slide. Block diamond, which you see at the right on this one, and this is another Dorflinger slide. The others are all from Hawks catalog. Grecian and hobnail which is at the lower right in this one. Large hobnail diamond, which is the left in this one. 
fan and diamond, princess, which is the top here, star and hobnail, which is the center one here, and which I have a great deal of trouble distinguishing from Russian, silver diamond, Japanese, hobnail and Russian, and Venetian, which is the center one here, and Brazilian, which is on the left. Now, Venetian and Brazilian were hawks patterns with patents, and I don't know whether uh, Dorflinger was selling those as Dorflinger or as hawks, but he certainly ordered them from hawks. In 1888 and 1889, cobweb and Parisian were ordered most frequently. But by 1892, the cheaper strawberry diamond and fan was the most common pattern in the orders. For most of these, Dorflinger supplied the blanks. However, in some cases, Hawk got, Hawks got the blanks from CGW or some other source. In January 1888, Dorflinger sent their Mr. Martin to England to buy blanks, which they offered to share with Hawks. They bought especially large quantities of cased stemware blanks that summer. However, on February 9, 1888, Louis Dorflinger wrote, what does Corning Glass Works charge for ruby-plated straight stem hawks? Bowl-only plated, leg and foot, flint. Need in ruby and amber if price not too high. On May 11th, the plated goblet blanks were ordered, and the ruby ones were still being ordered from Corning in the summer of 1892. It came as something of a surprise to me that so much Parisian was ordered by Dorflinger. However, when the pattern was first introduced in the late 1880s, it was being made in quantity in Corning for Dorflinger. On May 3rd, 1888, Louis Dorflinger wrote, we could not afford to pay over 14 to $15 a dozen for the Parisian tumblers. We think you can cut them for this. Our boys can cut Parisian in such work as tumblers and nappies. The phrasing of that particular letter leads one to think that it was because Hawks had better cutters rather than that Dorflinger had too many orders that Dorflinger turned to Hawks to secure some of this glass. This was probably due to the Dorflinger strike, which was going on at that time. On the other hand, some of the work supplied by Hawks may have been sold as Hawks glass, particularly the cobweb, uh, Venetian, and Brazilian. On May 11, 1888, Dorflinger wrote, we respect your rights in the cobweb cutting and have never cut any here. <clears throat> and one letter that went from Hawks to Dorflinger, which kind of surprised me, uh, in February 1889, Hawks wrote to Dorflinger, we have an order from a customer for a small set of your Parisian glass cut on our 356 blanks. We do not wish to proceed with the order unless we have your permission to cut it. Can we do so? Would you prefer that we send you the blanks and that you cut it? As we understand the order from our customer, they have sold it to a customer of theirs and it does not go in their stock. So obviously, Hogs wasn't cutting Parisian except when he was asked to do so. Uh, <clears throat> on January 3rd, 1889, Dorflinger wrote, we expect to largely increase our work with you as we intend to push sales of cut glass this year to the fullest extent and be prepared with a large stock to fill orders promptly. A few weeks later, Hawks wrote, please send us round nappies heavy enough for Russian cutting. As your molds are the same size and shape as ours, it will not be necessary for us to send you molds for these goods. Hawks, most of Hawks' molds were at Corning Glass. A few days later, Hawks wrote, your order of the 7th inst received, also checked for $853.47, which represents charges for about a month's worth of glass. At this time, Hawks was supplying Davis Collimore and Company in New York City, his biggest customer, about $1,000 a month worth of cut glassware. So you can see that Dorflinger wasn't very far behind. Oddly enough, both Hawks and Dorflinger seemed to wish to keep this connection a secret. On August 24, 1892, Hawks wrote, we have given notice to our packer to mark all glass blanks and are sorry the mistake should have occurred. Uh, we'll hurry the salad, strawberry, diamond, and fan. They are now being cut for you. So apparently, the glass being sent to White Mills, uh, well, the packages were not supposed to, no one was supposed to know that cut glass instead of blanks was inside. On September 21st, Hawks wrote to Dorflinger, we are in receipt of letters from our agent now in the West complaining that he is handicapped by statements made by your salesman, Mr. Shipman, that C. Dorflinger and Sons furnish us blanks. You can understand the impression created by such statements and the difficulties in overcoming them with the educated trade. We would ask your kindly interference in the matter. On the same day, Hawks wrote to their salesman, W.H. Bryant, that he had written to Dorflinger and Mr. Shipman would get a talking to. 
We do not especially claim that our glass is better than door flingers as far as the color goes, but we do claim it is better in design and finish and the general care that is taken in its production. Every time that Dorflinger's agent quotes us using their blanks only discounts their own standing and redounds to our advantage. Well, I find that puzzling because uh, Hawks was buying quantities of blanks from Dorflinger at this time. In June of the same year, Hawks had written to a long-standing Syracuse customer that he would not sell to dry goods houses, even if they did advertise corning glass. Our goods are sold as the Hawks glass, and that fact is becoming generally known and the frequent inquiries our customer have for the Hawks glass convinces us that all the efforts we have made by our liberal advertising to bring the fact before the public that there will be no conflicting our goods with those put upon the market as corning glass. The reference here could be either to Hoare's glass or to, I think they just didn't want to be mixed up with corning glassworks, which was seen as a commercial concern. But Hawks is certainly anxious to conceal the source of his blanks. It was not an accident uh, that his trademark did not have the word corning in it. It merely said Hawks. Since imported glass still had more prestige than American, it is likely that Hawks was trying to imply that his glass was European in origin, or at any rate to disassociate himself from American roots. After Hawks won his gold medal in 1889, this need was less critical, but Hawks still seemed anxious to conceal the source of his blanks. That is, from the retail public. He obviously wasn't concealing it from the other glassmakers. I had hoped to find more information on some of the objects in our collection in these letters, and in that I was only partly successful. I did find a letter of November 30th, 1883, from S.B. Wellington, a broker in New York City, who was probably related to Quincy Wellington, the Corning banker. Wellington wrote to Charles F. Houghton, Amory Houghton's brother, and asked for toilet bottles to be engraved with the letter R for a man named Bowden to give us a gift. This pair of toilet bottles in our collection was acquired from the McCurins, who published it in 200 Years of American Glass, with the story that it was made in Corning and given as a gift by a banker named Bowden to a Miss Ellen Rogers. The McCurins dated it to 1890 and thought it was made by Hoare, which is a perfectly logical assumption at the time. I have no doubt that these bottles, though, are the ones ordered by Mr. Bowden through Mr. Wellington and that the blanks were made at Corning Glassworks uh, and the engraving done by Hawks in 1883. Charles F. Houghton ordered a number of monogram gifts from Tom Hawks uh, as VIP presents for customers, most of whom seemed to have railroad connections. He ordered colognes engraved with horses several times in 1883 and 1884, so we can assume that, that this pattern was a Hawks specialty. <coughs> I also found correspondence relating to the order for George V. M. Lathrop, the minister to Russia, who was appointed in 1885. He, or a representative, apparently visited Richard Briggs of Boston. Briggs was a Boston china and glass retailer in July of 1885 and gave an initial order which was confirmed in September. The set consisted of two and a half or three dozen each of a number of stemware shapes and some serving pieces, all to be cut in Russian. Briggs specified that the feet were not to be cut in Russian pattern but were to have the standard star bottom and no coat of arms or crest was mentioned on the order. By the time Lathrop uh, by the time the order was confirmed, Lathrop was already in St. Petersburg, so the set must have been shipped to him. And that's the Russian pattern. Sorry, I should have shown you that earlier. The Russian pattern had already been given that name by Briggs because on September 14, 1881, which is six months after Hawks went in business, in one of his first letters to Hawks, he wrote, As in my establishment, I have so many patterns of cut glass it is very confusing to my employees to remember the different cuttings by their numbers, so I will kindly ask you in future in both invoicing goods and receiving orders to call the two following patterns by these names, the number 283 pattern to be called the Russian pattern, the number 284 pattern to be called the Moscow pattern. Hawks patented the pattern the following June, 1882, but he did not use the name Russian in his pen. Briggs may have chosen the name because of the assassination that year of Tsar Alexander II. Previous sources have cited an order for the Russian embassy in Washington, as well as the one by Mr. Lather, but I can find no evidence of such an order, and I doubt that there was one. In spite of the Hawks patent, the Russian pattern appears in both Hoare and New England Glass Company catalogs under that name in the 1880s. The bottom row of stemware there is called uh, Pattern E or Russian, and this is a catalog of 1885 or 1886. Oddly enough, the Moscow pattern, so that's one pattern that, that went into universal production almost immediately after it was 
being made by Hawke, in spite of the patent. Oddly enough, the Moscow pattern does not seem to have been very popular. Either it was renamed or production was stopped because it does not appear in very many orders and none at all after about 1883. The correspondence makes it clear that from the beginning, Hawke's most important customers were Richard Briggs of Boston and Davis Collimore of New York City, both China and glass dealers, closely followed by J.E. Caldwell of Philadelphia, a jeweler. Uh, in Boston and Philadelphia, Briggs and Caldwell were Hawke's exclusive outlets. And in Chicago and Washington, Burley and Company, another jeweler, and Beveridge, who was a China and glass merchant, were Hawke's exclusive outlets. Nathan Dorman, uh, a China and glass merchant in San Francisco, also had an exclusive. However, Hawks refused to have only one outlet in New York City, in spite of repeated requests from Collimore. There are references to the fact that Hoare's New York outlet was Tiffany and & Company, and Hoare's was apparently the only American cut glass Tiffany sold, at least during the 1880s. Hawks sold through the largest jeweler in most cities and allowed his biggest accounts, Briggs and Collimore and several others, to have large inventories of goods on memorandum which were paid for as they were sold. Memorandum apparently is a synonym for on consignment. The Dorflinger store in New York City had large quantities of goods on memorandum for which they accounted several times a year. As Hawks became better known in 1890 and 1891, there are indications that he was canceling most of these memorandum accounts, at least in the smaller stores. Richard Briggs was one customer for whom Hawks did a lot of special work. In 1884, Mr. Briggs sent Hawks a plaster cast of an antique French tumbler, which he wished to have copied. When Hawks came up with a matching stemware line, Briggs named it Louis XIV. <clears throat> and we were very fortunate this year that Tom Dimitrov, who's a local collector, uh, gave us a place setting of Louis XIV from a set which he'd purchased. And throughout the decade, uh, Briggs ordered large quantities of that pattern to be monogrammed or engraved with crest. The pattern belonged to Briggs exclusively, and Hawks didn't make it for anyone else, and eventually in 1889, Briggs had it patented. Much of it was cut on Baccarat blanks, which were supplied by Briggs to Hawks, and the latter firm occasionally complained about the thinness and brittleness of the French blanks. Hawks' earliest catalog was a boxed set of photographs mounted on cards, which he loaned to his customers. In the 1880s, he accepted small orders at retail from customers all around New York State and nearby Pennsylvania, and he sent the cards out frequently to, to customers who were ordering Christmas presents or wedding presents. Later in the decade, he referred many of these individual orders to the nearest of his retail customers. Sometime in about 1888, he began to refer to his photograph book, which apparently replaced the cards. This had full-page photographs, and in fact, a copy is to be seen in the lower left corner of this picture. This is a hawk salesman in 1905 uh, with his, in a hotel room in Dallas with his goods spread out on the table. And you can see that he has uh, the catalog at the foot of his bed waiting to show to his customers. From time to time, Hawks would ask the stores to return their copy of the book so that he could update it. He did not issue a printed catalog until at least 1905. On the basis of number of orders, the most popular patterns in the 1880s were Russian, Princess, Cobweb, Grecian, Strawberry Diamond, Hobnail, Table Diamond, Venetian, Brazilian, and Empress. These accounted for about 75% of the orders, and that's only 10 patterns. One of the subjects about which I was most curious was the Paris exhibition of 1889, which Hawks featured so often in its ads. Fortunately, the letters do cover that period, and Hawks' exhibit is very well documented. There are many letters to and from Davis Collimore, with whom Hawks, Hawks exhibited, orders to Gorham for silver fittings, to Dorflinger for punch bowl blanks, and to the American Morocco Case Company for white satin lined oak cases with brass corners. <clears throat> and I'm going to read you just a few of these letters. Um, in January, Hawks wrote to Carlton Bonfils, who was a principal in the firm of Davis Collimore. Some of the exhibition goods are commencing to come in from the shops finished, and we must say they are really beautiful. Most of the goods that we are getting up are new designs expressly for this occasion, and we must say that they exceed all our former efforts. They are costing us a great deal of money, but of course you understand that we wish to send glass second to none. What we want is the metal. And somewhat surprisingly, in March, a flunky at Davis Collimore wrote to Hawks, 
I mailed you two jury papers for use at the exhibition. Please inform me if a medal is awarded or any award is made, to whom will the award be made out to? And Hawks wrote back almost immediately, your favor received, we've already sent our report for the jury to the commissioners. If any medal is awarded, we are to have it, as that is what we are exhibiting for. And as you know, they did get the medal. Um, <clears throat> I won't read you the entire list of pieces sent, but it is there in the papers. And I can tell you that the first shipment consisted of 213 pieces, counting several ladles as separate pieces, and eight Morocco cases lined with white satin. And here they all are, uh, well, here most of them are, sitting in Hawk's showroom. We even have letters documenting that he arranged to have this photograph made and the title printed on it, uh, but it was the good scent for the exhibition. The punch bowl scent were two 15-inch ones in Venetian and large hobnail in cases, which you see here. A 14-inch one in luster pattern and a 13-inch one in cobweb pattern. These were priced at $136, $128 for the two biggest ones, $100 and $40 respectively. There were two large five light candelabra priced at $75 each and you can see those on the center table in the back. And a number of smaller ones and most of the remaining shipment consisted of bowls and dishes in a variety of sizes and patterns. Tumblers and stemware are not listed, although they do appear in the upper shelves in this photograph, which is a little surprising. There was an ice cream set in Grecian pattern, which consisted of a 14-inch tray and a dozen 7-inch plates in a fitted oak case with a drawer, and two pairs of pillars and lace hobnail decanters, also in cases. The only colored glass in the first shipment were four champagne jugs with silver tops, two green and two ruby, cut in Roman pattern, and priced at $200 and $155 each. I think that they're in the back right. I can see them in the photograph. There were also a pair of green wine decanters in Grecian and hobnail pattern, and a pair of ruby ones in Grecian pattern, which cost only $35 for each piece. There was no engraved glass in this shipment, no stemware, and nothing in chrysanthemum pattern, in spite of the fact that Samuel Hawkes gave this plate to the Leitner Museum with the notation that it was exhibited in Paris. A few weeks later, Hawk sent a second shipment, which included two nine light candelabras at $135 each, one place setting of stemware in Grecian pattern, one 18 inch punch bowl in Russian and notched fillers, which cost $300, which was a huge sum, a handled and footed lamp with dome shade in plaid pattern, and I think I can see that on the center table there, and nine smaller pieces. This was nowhere near the quantity Hawks later claimed to have sent. In a deposition in a court case later on, Hawks said that he sent 615 pieces. And try as I might, I can only make it out to about 250. So I don't understand the difference in the numbers. Now, and neither shipment <clears throat> includes this vase, which we previously thought to have been exhibited in Paris. The blank for the large 18-inch punch bowl was ordered from Dorflinger, and Hawks sent them a special mold for it. As it turned out, the mold didn't work and it had to be free blown. <clears throat> because of its size, they had to re they had to tear out the opening for their glory coal and re redo it. And they also had problems getting a white enough metal. They ordered a special special raw materials to make a good enough batch. So there was a lot of correspondence about the blanks, and Dorflinger finally delivered two in late February. They weighed thirty five pounds each, and Hawks was delighted with them. He responded that they were the very best blanks he'd ever had from Dorflinger. One was finished in about a month and sent in the second shipment on March 26. The other, at Louis Dorflinger's request, was to be cut in the same pattern and sent to Dorflinger's Murray Street store for exhibition and sale. So there should be two of those big 18-inch punch bowls around, but I've never seen them. The patterns listed in the two shipments include the standard ones Hawks was already selling. Venetian, large hobnail, luster, cobweb, princess, empress, Russian, Russian and pillars, Russian and sharp pillars, Russian and notched pillars, Russian and stars, stars and fans and lace hobnail, Grecian, Grecian and hobnail, Japanese, Persian and pillars, pillars and silver diamond, one sugar and creamer in strawberry diamond and fan, the four silver mounted champagne jugs in Roman, the lamp in plaid, and a candlestick in passion flower, which is a pattern I never heard of connected with Huck. There were also four ice bowls with silver rims, and the rims were also ordered from Gorm. The pattern for those was Grecian, were Grecian, Grecian and hobnail, and princess. And there were three large trays in Japanese, Grecian, and Grecian and hobnail. Otherwise, the great majority of the 200 pieces were 7-inch and 8-inch bowls. 
Collimore's agent, Mr. Bonfies, complained about the lack of stemware, saying that Webb was exhibiting 40 different patterns of stems and suggesting that Hawk send over some rock crystal samples engraved several years before and not sold. And the rock crystal, I think, was this pattern, which is Hawk's rock crystal pattern from their catalog. Uh, we can't tell how much of the glass was sold in Paris and what came home again. It seems likely that almost none of it came back to the United States, since several newspaper stories reported that Parisians were flocking to Colomore's exhibit. A story in the New York Times on June 30th said, the Hawk's cut glass made in Corning is already a familiar artistic interest to visitors and to the trade. The consequence is that already the larger portion of the exhibit has been sold. The glass celery dish is a novelty, and it will be the fashion next season. The great sensation, however, has been the cut glass lamps with the chimneys to match and the monster shades. Nothing of this kind was ever seen here before, and the Parisians have gone wild on the subject. All the title names of France are represented on the visiting cards attached to the articles sold, and conspicuous is that of Princess Gorchakov, wife of the Chamberlain of the Tsar. Apparently, Colomore did send over several more small shipments to fill out empty spaces as the objects were sold, but unfortunately, there were no more lists. Uh, another thing which I found to be of interest, just when they were getting ready in February, one of the letters from Davis Collimore to Hawk said, we have heard that Tiffany and Company will make a special feature at the exposition of Hoare's glass, silver mounted. My informant thinks their display will be confined to mounted pieces. And Hawks wrote back practically the following day, years of the second receive, we have known for some time that J. Hoare and Company are getting up some clarets, etc., for silver mounting for Tiffany's exhibit at Paris. We do not think that we need to be in the least worried about Tiffany or J. Hoare & Co. Our exhibit will be exclusively rich cut glass with some few pieces mounted in silver to give tone to the exhibit. And when you get it all arranged with the taste that we think you are going to display in the matter, we are under the impression that there will be nothing better at the exposition. For our part, we are not sparing time or money to make it so. In a letter to Briggs in March, Hawk said, most of the goods that we sent to the exhibition were expensive and we did not cut duplicates. However, we will cut duplicates for you of what we think would be the most saleable and have them ready on your return from Europe. Mr. Bonfice also complained about the cost of the silver mounted champagne jugs, which were $200 apiece, and Hawks responded that the silver from Gorham had cost him $75 apiece, and the cutting had been so difficult that the pieces had already cost him more than $200. Now that's pretty much the end of my information on the uh, Paris exhibit. But I have a few other things that I thought were kind of interesting. Oh, here's one more. Uh, you can't see so well in the slide, but actually you can make out pieces very well. These, these two slides, which I showed this one and the one earlier, are of Hawk's exhibit with Colomar at the Paris Exposition. And if you look at them under a magnifying glass, you can see quite a few of the pieces fairly well. So they're, uh, they're well focused. You can see the nine light candelabras as well as the lamps and, some of, and the big punch bowl. Now, I'm going to read you <clears throat> one thing I thought was kind of interesting. A letter, this is a, from the photographic catalog. You see bells. On the left, I think it says dinner bells, and on the right, table bells. And I have a letter to Davis Collimore in which Hawk says, in regard to the bells sent on special order, I would say that we use the bowls of broken hawks and clarets for these bells, as we have had before explained to you. But as we had none in stock cut Russian, we sent the nearest thing we can. We can cut a bell especially for you if you wish, but it would be considerably more expensive, as we only put these bells in at these prices to get rid of our broken hocks. Please let us know if we shall do so, or shall we wait until we have some more broken hocks cut Russian? It may be some months before we do, however. So the bell on the left there, which was a little more expensive, you ordered apparently in, in various patterns, but the bells on the right with the silver foot, you had to wait until they broke some. Now I'm going to close the last two or three slides I have by talking about a mystery I've been working on off and on for several years. It has nothing to do with the Hawks letters, actually. It's something else. Oh, sorry, I had one more thing I put in. This is a, we have a design catalog, which we got from Hawks in the 70s. And it has pen and ink drawings of some very elaborate pieces, and they were all seem to have done by a designer who worked for Hawks in the early years. In most cases, we've not actually seen the objects, only these designs. Uh, and they seem to span quite a period of time from about 1900 up to the 20s. So this is one which I think is very handsome and which is identified as a set that Hawks made for Henry Clay Frick, the Pittsburgh uh, man. 
Now this is a tumbler, which we acquired uh, as a Sinclair tumbler, which uh, was a gift to us from uh, Mrs. Douglas Sinclair. And it's a very handsome, deeply engraved piece, but it seems to be in exactly the same pattern as that Hawks design uh, that was made for Frick, which I find kind of puzzling. I haven't had a chance to talk to Tell about that, as a matter of fact, because I just discovered it the other day in looking, getting the lecture ready. Uh, in that same design book, well, here I'll, now, this piece is an English one in our collection, which came to us from Jerome Strauss as Stevens and Williams. I wrote to Stevens and Williams and confirmed that years ago, and they told me the pattern was cut for a number of years. This one is signed Beach, and they had an engraver by that name. Not long after, a number of glasses in the same pattern surfaced in an estate sale in this country, all in the same pattern, signed variously by Hall, Knee, or Critchie, and with the addition of a monogram G crowded into the pattern like an afterthought. I assume these glasses to be English, probably Webb, because of Fritchie's signature, and wished I had one for our collection. I didn't actually connect them with this. Recently, I visited the Smithsonian and discovered that among the glasses they received in 1965 from Samuel Hawke's daughter is one of those Frick glasses, or goblets, and another goblet from the set ordered by E.H. Gary of Chicago, the steel magnet, which is cut in this pattern with the identical G crowded into the engraving. However, it has no engraver's signature, only the Hawke's trademark on the foot, and the blank is slightly different, with a larger knob with an air trap more stem above the knob, between the knob and the, and the bowl, and no scalloping on the foot. The plot thickened when I discovered this drawing in the Hawks design book, which we've had here for a decade or so. You see, that is supposed to be the set made for Gary of Chicago, but the piece at the Smithsonian does not match uh, the set that's dispersed among several collectors in the United States, nor does it match this drawing. The only problem is uh, the pattern is identical but the blank in this drawing doesn't match the glass in Washington. So now I'm left wondering, is the set with the G monogram scattered among several collectors in the United States an English one, or is it the one Hawks supplied to Gary? And if it is the one that Hawks supplied to Gary, how much work did Hawks do on it? Did he just order it from England and sell it to E.H. Gary? Eventually, I hope to have some answers, but right now that's an unsolved mystery. And if anybody has any information for me on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Or any questions? Thank you very much, Jane. Any questions? Yes. Uh, just uh, Ian wanted to know if there were any indications that Hawk sent colored cut to clear glass to Paris. Uh, just those jugs that I mentioned, some red and some green. There were a total of uh, the four silver mounted ones and four others in cases, and that was it. Uh, the reason I was particularly interested in the exposition glass is because I often get letters from people who say, I have in my family a punch bowl which is supposed to have been exhibited at the Paris Exposition or, a, or something else. And now, you know, before I never had anything to say except, well, hopefully yes. But uh, now that I have this list, in the last six months or so, I've looked up several things and been able to say, well, they didn't exhibit any punch bowls in that pattern in Paris or that size or whatever. Anybody else? Any questions? Okay. Uh, I'd like to make one observation, and that is the enormous volume of materials that was in this acquisition that we made. is It's an incredible treasure trove, but it is also one of the most fragile treasures that we have in the museum. You can imagine that paper that's been sitting around uncared for in unheated uh, garages, not only the coal smoke that it acquired while it was here in Corning, uh, makes these documents really uh, the most fragile things that we have in our possession. So when we acquired them, we did tell collectors that we would not allow them to see the original documents until they had been microfilmed. And we, of course, uh, this collection came to us at the end of the year. We had already set our budget for the next year, and we simply had no money to do the microfilming. And yet collectors were clamoring to see this, these documents. Well, we went out to a variety of organizations asking if they would help us uh, to supply the funds for microfilming, and we were extremely successful in this. And I believe that all of the letters have now been microfilmed and are available to you if you're interested in seeing them here. 
And I understand that we have another presentation today. Uh, well, I'm looking for Mickey Doro. Is Mickey here? There, there she is. is. There she is. Because we also had a lot of volunteers. Uh, so we also had a lot of volunteers who came down and helped us sort the material, which that was very time consuming, as you can imagine. It was hundreds of man hours. Fifteen years ago, the Westchester Glass Com uh, Club had their first glass show and sale. It has become so successful that we found ourselves in the wonderful position of having more money than we needed to run our schedule, and we decided to share it with those who enrich the glass world. Recently, we have given donations to the Creative Glass Society, the Sandwich Museum, the Jones Museum, and it is with great pleasure that we are able to give this gift to the Corning Museum of $2,000 because they have given so much to all of us. Well, obviously I'm delighted, I'm thrilled. Uh, it's a very generous gift and uh, it will go to very good use. So we do thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay, uh, time for coffee. We're right on schedule. The uh, next lecture will begin at 11 o'clock with Ian Burke speaking about the sort of worms in the woodwork, recent fakes in American brilliant cut glass.